nice, nice to, uh, it's, it's, it's exciting to lecture to you guys. I really actually love teaching, and it's one of the reasons I want to be in academics. Um, the, uh, this, this, this is, uh, I think, a topic that um, I used to dread as a resident, like getting lectured to. It was just a guaranteed sleeper. Um, <laughs> the, uh, on a Monday morning, it's, it's like even worse. So the, uh, but I, I've come to actually really enjoy a lot of this stuff as I've understood it better. Um, and I think typically it's poorly explained. Um, a lot of these tests you do for business and all this, you know, retinal correspondence and when it's anomalous and all these things. So hopefully, uh, as we go through some of this, I think, I think this is pediatric ophthalmology. A lot of it's not easily testable, but a lot of the stuff is. So it, it's, I, I'm much more into clinical stuff than just teaching to OCAPs. But I think there's some, some high yield stuff on OCAPs. So the, uh, I won't be offended if you fall asleep. I notoriously fell asleep in almost every lecture. <laughs> I, don't know, I, I can't. I can't hold still and stay awake. I don't know what it is. Um, the uh, so um, nonverbal pediatric eye exam. A, a lot of the stuff you gotta. So peds you split into all sorts of different things. The verbal child versus the nonverbal child, and, and how you approach them differently. So the kid who can tell you what you know what letters he could see in the eye chart uh, is uh, is a big difference that versus the kid who can't. So. In a nonverbal patient, what are, you, what are you looking? What are you trying to test? What can you test? Fix and follow. Fix and follow. Yeah. So it's a visual acuity, right? You want to think big picture. What am I looking for? I'm actually doing the equivalent of visual acuity. What other way can you text, test uh, visual acuity at this age? Preferential. Yeah. Perfect. What's now? We, I don't know if anyone uses here, but have you guys heard of CSM? Central Steady Maintained. So it's, it's, a, it's another way that you test visual acuity in kids. I guess you can say, I, I, I actually love pediatric opto. I'm back up for a sec. I love peds opto, and I'm, I'm surprised why more people, more people don't go into it, but there's obvious reasons that some people don't go into it. So the, uh, we'll try to get, you know, try to, when you work with us, hopefully we'll get you to figure out how to test the eye exam before it turns into this. But um, I'm a big fan of toys, if anyone, uh, if anyone's worked with me. So, so general visual acuity, the, uh, Central, so CSM is something that people, I, I don't think this department uses it as much, but a lot of pediatric ophthalmology departments use CSM for visual acuity. And so we're going to walk through what that means. So the first C, or the first letter C is central. Now, any guesses what central is testing? Yeah, yeah, good, Ashley. So it's, it's, not, it's not just fixing, but if, it's, 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 if they fix and their eye looks straight as they're fixing. So when would your eye not look straight but, fix, be, but be fixing? The angle kappa. Damn, nice. <laughs> Sorry, I don't understand angle kappa until like, I feel like recently. So nice job, Ashley. So do you, test like do, do you test centrally, when you do central, do you test it monocularly or binocularly? Any other? There you go. It's a good chance. The vote is split. This was on um, opto questions last year. I remember seeing it. Makes me feel like this is something that's worthwhile. Because, like, yeah, two of them are binocular and one of them is It's It's flipped so it's, it's so, so it's, this is monocular because if somebody has an ET, what's the eye that's, the eye that's deviated in? Is that central? Technically, no, but if you cover up a good eye, then you can really see if they have, you know, a, a line of sight. So, so, um, it, I, I hope this is a safe place to just guess and get it wrong and not feel stupid, because um, I'd rather have you just guess and get it wrong than not say anything at all. I, I feel like I learn a lot more when I kind of put myself out there. Um, so you can just really check with the corneal reflex to make sure they're looking straight at you. You test it monocularly, um, and you're looking for extra fulvial fixation or angle kappa. And so we'll talk about that. Steady, what is, so uh, let me just back up. So if, if it's, if, the, if they're not central, then the way you, you, you um, chart this is you say UC or uncentral. So a kid can be CSM or UC, US, UM, or any combination of those. So what's steady testing for? Any thoughts? What, when is an eye unsteady? Nice diagonals. Nice diagonals, yep. Um, do you think this one's tested monocularly or binocularly? Was that Chris? You said one and two, so binocular. 
It's the last one is binocular. Oh, so, that is good. No, no, no. I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad you're guessing. Yeah. So, are you going to pick up latent nystagmus if you're testing this, testing it this way? No. Who said no? Nice. What did we say? It's yes, but that was pretty confident, so I liked it. The, um, so that's the reason you're testing it monocularly, is you're going to cover one eye and still see if it's, see if it's still steady. Because what's the definition of latent nystagmus? Nystagmus is not always there. Nystagmus, yeah, only comes out with monocular testing. So it's, it's, why, it's why it's latent. So and that's why it's important to do the test of monocularly. Um, maintain. Uh, um, anyone anyone want, to take, want to take a gander on this? I'm going to make you guess the whole morning, so please, please keep, keep going. Continued fixation with movement? With, with uncovering. Oh. How's that? Or, or, or with, so, 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 yeah, so if I'm looking at you with this eye, so maintained is the one that's binocularly tested. If I uncover this eye, is this, if I, un if I uncover the other eye, is that I still looking at you? And you still keep the target central, or can you, you I thought you kind of moved it around, right? No? Uh, you're not testing motility with okay. this, or versions, or reductions, or anything. You're just seeing, if, are they still holding an eye at you? So what would be a situation where you would have unmaintained? Can anyone give me kind of a scenario? I'll give you a hint. If you're ortho, mm -hmm. and I uncover your other eye, is, is there going to be any shifting? No. So, so what would be a situation where there would be shifting? Yeah, so you've got your business, and then one other thing. So if I'm ET, and this eye, this eye's covered, this eye's looking at you, and I uncover, what's going to make me want to go switch to the other eye? And, and yeah, yeah if, I've got, if, if I've got an eye preference, and, and the preference is to the other eye. Does that make sense? So all this talk about um, the fixing eye, or the eye preference, or maintaining it, you're looking for amblyopia. You're looking for they've got preference for one eye over the other. Um, and then the kid this young, the reason you care about that is because amblyopia is extremely sensitive, both in terms of it's really sensitive to strabismus and anisometropia and deprivation, but it's also really sensitive to patching. So the earlier you catch this, the earlier you intervene, the, the, least, the less deep the amblyopia will be and the faster the recovery will be. So we're talking about fixing eye, eye preference and and whether it's maintained, again, we're just trying to see if we can find that. Um, I, fix and follow, I think, is nice because you, you still test it monocularly. You, um, you just move the patient. What, what sort of fixation targets do you think work the best in the nonverbal age range? Zero to two. Any guesses what the first thing a child really sees and appreciates? Face. Faces. Faces. Yeah. So I, put, I used to put a toy in my mouth and I move the toy with, with, my, with my teeth and make a bunch of sounds and then I just look at them and they just, they just will fix it right on your face. And then, so what I do is I do fix and follow and then I look for the fixing eye and I do that by just covering and uncovering each eye, seeing if there's a shift in which I essentially looks at me the most. And then I look for nystagmus. And I, you're essentially doing the same thing as CSM but just in maybe I think more straightforward ways. Does that make sense? But hopefully CSM, I think you do get tested on that, so. Let's review late nystagmus. MJ is demonstrating it with, you know, a one-handed glove, that is perfect. The, um, so, usually appears within the first few months of life, uh, first few months of life, and it's a horizontal jerk nystagmus. Any guesses, this is another kind of high yield low cap thing, um, and a great way to identify late nystagmus. Um, does the, does the, the, the fast, fast beat go away from the occluder or towards? You ever said this one? Towards? Away. Away, yeah. <laughs> nice. The, uh, so the, uh, the way you think about that is I just think it's always trying to get away from the occluder. So it's, try, it's, it's trying to you know, sneak off the other way. It will switch when you go to the other eye. It's the only nystagmus that has a fast beat that switches that, uh, in, in that manner. So you see a late nystagmus in, in kids who have this strabismus complex, like ET, DVD, or a fusion is compromised from an early age. So we're going to talk a lot about that later on. Usually poor stereopsis, again, because it comes in with, comes in with, uh, oh, which, oh, this late. So yeah, you usually see, again, like a genital ET, DVD, the eyes are just not very well aligned, so they don't get good stereo. 
and uh, it's going to throw off monocular testing. Why? So if you test the visual acuity, you cover one eye at a time. Why is that going to screw up their testing? Yeah, you're going to give them a stagma, so it's going to throw off the visual acuity. How, how is amblyopia treatment going to be affected by late nystagmus? Why can't you pinch? Then they're just going to have a yeah. Maybe it's obvious, but yeah, exactly. So you don't, you don't have to think about this. As you're seeing the kid, you see latent stems, and then they find out that they have amblyopia. You've got to get creative in how you're going to treat them. Like foggy in one lens with like just a stronger prescription is going to blur them more than their amblyopia, so that they'll start looking through the other eye, but not enough to cause latent nystagmus. So I, a few times I'm going to do these asides. Like late, I'm, like a whole lecture of nystagmus to me is it's like torture. So we're going to do. So I'm going to try to throw in some pearls here that relate to what we're talking about. But moving on, the nonverbal eye exam, you do a lot of motility and alignment checking, just like this car, right? That's what we're taught to be auto mechanics. Nobody thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, that was like pounding me like over and over in school. You're, we're not mechanics taking care of the whole person. So that was sarcastic. The, um, so alignment fixation is the key. We already talked about that. And eye preference. Um, uh, is also really important. So let me ask you a question. How do you, um, we talked about maintain how it doesn't, it's hard to tell which eye is a fixing eye in a child who's straight. How do you, how, how do you figure out eye preference in, in that child? Is there a way to do that? <coughs> Prisms, uh, expound. Expound. Um, I can't remember, is it four base? Four, four base up would be within our um, uh, fusional vergence range. Okay. So you, you got to so if I put a four base prism up in front of your eye, your eyes would actually make a readjustment to line it back up. So but you're you're on the right track. You do like a like a, anywhere from like a fifteen to a twenty. Oh, okay. So so you can tell the fixing eye in a kid who's not straight, right? So you make them uh, you make them not straight if they're orthoid by putting a prism in front of their eye. I usually do like base down or base up, and that splits the images, and then you just look at which one they look at. So if I put a prism in front of this eye, and so if it's a base down prism, the image is going to appear up, so they're gonna, their eyes, the, the eyes are both going to look up when the prism is in front of it. So I'm going to walk you through this. I put a prism in front of the right eye, and both their eyes refixate up. I take the prism off, they go back down. I put the prism in front of the left eye, and nothing happens. What's, what, what, what is that? How do you describe that? What's going on? Fixed with the right. Fixing with the right, and probably have some amblyopia in the left eye because they never, they, that doesn't cause them to refixate. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what you do with that test. It's called the, indu the induced tropia test. So and it's, a good, it's a good name, it actually makes sense. So, um, so we're gonna talk about these uh, strabismus prefixes and acronyms just briefly. You guys probably all know this stuff, but Bob Hoffman, we, were, so we saw a, a note that had all these acronyms on it, and Bob said, oh, this reminds me of TMA. You know, does anyone know what TMA stands for? Too many acronyms. <laughs> That's clever. The, uh, it's, it's like Bob, perfect Bob humor. The, uh, so um, ET, XT, you guys probably all know ET's crossed, XT's out. Does the hypertropia need laterality? to it? Yes. How come the horizontal ones don't? True. Yep. It, it's because our eyes are on a horizontal plane. So, so, so that's the difference. Vertical ones, is, you, if your eyes are on a horizontal plane, you can't tell which one's up or down. Um, occasionally, we do say laterality, though, for the ETs or the XTs. Why is that? Any guesses? It's a great example, yeah. It's, it's clearly on one side in that case. Any other thoughts? Don't we sometimes do that if it's the amblyopic eye? Like if it's the if it's, Yeah. Okay, well, sorry. No, if, they have cl if they have clear, a clear eye preference, and it's always the left eye that's turned in. Yeah. So usually if you don't write left or right, it means that they probably have alternate fixation. Um, so we're going to run through these quickly. I want, I want, I want everyone to kind of uh, speak up and just guess if you, uh, um, I, know, I know we've got two people who've been through the P's rotation, which is a little disadvantage, but um, I want other people just to guess if, uh, as well. So parentheses, what does parentheses mean when you, when you document that? 
Any guesses? It's a business. Yeah. What? Is that okay if I say it? Yeah. This? Yeah. Okay. There's a few seconds, but it's okay to let it linger just a little bit, a little you know? Longer. Okay. No, no, no. You're fine. No, I want you to keep guessing. The, uh, so if there's intermittent, are they, able, are they able to fuse? Yes. 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 Um, whoops. Apostrophe means it's checked in the air. Laterality we already talked about. Um, and then if there's no T, what does that mean? If it's just E. Yeah, good job, Chris. Um, so you only see it when fusion is disrupted. So let's talk about some testing that we do with the occluder. You guys have seen on the optho exam um, in EPIC. Do you know that, do you, I'm sure you all do a little black thing as an occluder that gets you to the alignment exam. It's like so small and it's pixelated. It's hard to tell. I don't know what that was for a while. It's, it's, it's supposed to be actually one of these. Um, the, uh, so there's, there's three kind of main tests that we do. Um, and I want to I'm jump to, let's see, going to let me, the strabismus simulator. So this was done by um, a guy named Farouk Ornate who uh, trained at Indiana where I trained in pediatric ophthalmology. And he works in, um, it's in Ohio, I can't remember if it's at it's not a Ohio State, but the, um, I, I think it's pretty helpful, and at least, at least to explain some of these basic things um, and, and, how you, and how the occluder, t occluder testing works. How's everybody's weekend, by the way? Great. Was Carl busy this weekend? Yeah. It's kind of like a moment of silence for Carl there. <laughs> um, you guys seem like you have a really busy call here. How, how, how many sleepless nights do you have on call on average? Or how much sleep do you get on average on call, would you say? Four or five hours. Yeah. Well, I would say four hours. Yeah. On average, be four hours with a handful of sleepless nights. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll tell you, so I'm going to throw in some stories that will hopefully just make you feel better about yourself <laughs> throughout this. Story number one, I was an intern, or first year resident, and it was, we did buddy call for three months, um, which was a long time, but we didn't have the intern year here. So, um, I was just at the part, at the point where I could start doing, like, not be on buddy call and handle things on my own. And it was 2 a.m. I got called in to see this guy who was playing of eye pain, but he was also totally encephalopathic and homeless and not really with it. And um, the, uh, um, I would go see him, passed out, and then someone's like, someone said, well, he's in DKA. I'm like, oh, yeah. There's an association with Mucor. This is awesome. I know. I know stuff. You know. So I feel really good. I go do the exam, and he's just like passed out. And I go look at his CT, and he's got sinus disease, but that's it. And I thought, yeah, the eyes look fine. I don't think this is mucor. But to be honest, if I was really being honest with myself, I didn't really know what mucor looked like anyway. But I thought, this is a mucor, and I call my resident. I'm like, don't worry, he'll come in. I've got this. Um, the next day, he gets reexamined again, and someone said, oh my gosh. DKA in the, with, with sinus disease in the setting of DKA is mucor. And they like urgently, emergently did this uh, endoscopic uh, biopsy of the tissue and it was just fluidly positive. And for the next 48 hours, I thought I had killed him. Because if you don't catch mucor quickly, it's, I mean, it's, it's frequently fatal, at least to the eye, if not to the person. So it was just the most humiliating moment of, of, of residency. And I just feel like residency is over and over again, it's just like gutters and strikes, gutters and strikes, gutters and strikes. You're like something goes well and you're like, I, I, I've got this. And then you just feel like three gutters. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's endlessly humbling. And the taste of humble pie gets old. The, um, uh, let's see, did I do the right one? Hold on a sec. Okay, so, so we're gonna talk about the cover on cover test for just a second here. Um, so the so let's let's give this patient let's make this uh, let's give this patient an XT, and this is on the Academy website. It's pretty nice. So this patient's got an XT, um, and then they're fixing with the right eye. So the cover on cover test, I'm just I really all I do is I just go on and off, on and off. That's cover on cover, and in this case, it's really helpful because what, what do I learn as I do the cover on cover test on this kid on this patient? 
You can tell the right eye is fixing because it fixes right back to the right eye as I uncover it. And then you also see a shift because you can't always tell. Like if, you know, say this is, say this is 10, I'm not really sure if that's a strabismus or not. But then, as you, but then you see that they, they quickly, you see that eye, what we call that refixation movement as you uncover it. And then I go to the other eye and what, what's, what's going to happen? Nothing, yeah. So I'm yeah, clearly fixing with that eye. So that's, that's the cover on cover test. There's also something called the simultaneous prism cover testing. Super confusing. But what you do is, let's say this was, I can't do this way, I can't move the mouth quick enough. But the simultaneous prism cover testing is that I cover the fixing eye and then I put a prism on the other eye at the same time to see if I can neutralize any movement. So what I do is I, I put this prism here and, I, and then at the same time I put the prism on and off. But I do the prism and the occlude at the same time. It's a little confusing, but I'll tell you, we'll talk about why we use that. The alternate, alternate uh, prism covering is when I go back and forth. So you're going to see a refixation movement each time you move back and forth. And then you put a prism in front of the eye, and then you go back and forth like this until you see it neutralized. So will somebody define for me what a foria is? like a great definition. The, um, so, um, our, let me ask you a question. Are, are, are our eyes perfectly straight uh, in the relaxed state? Who here has got a console to go look at somebody in the ICU who's got this big XT or ET and they're just totally zonked? And you say, you broke their fusion by zonking them. They're snowed. Of course they have XT. Like most, of us, most of us would do that or a lot of us would do that. So, so let me show you what happens when I cover up this eye. See how it kind of breaks later? You break fusion, and then the eyes just say, well, gosh, if I can't fuse, I might as well just go to my relaxed, happy place, which may be ET or XT. It's different for all of us. And you guys can test this. I want you to look, look at that little target right here. Look right there. Cover up one eye. Hold it there for like five seconds, and then switch to the other eye. How, how much does it jump? Does it a little bit, or does it jump side to side, or up and down, or diagonally? Just, just kind of go back and forth. Hold it for a few seconds. Are you, are you seeing a little jump there? Yes. Yep. And then and then and then go back go back and forth kind of quickly kind of go faster and faster and you'll see that jump will kind of slowly come together because if you go fast enough then you'll 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 get back to fusing. But when you when you break fusion you'll see that, that you'll you'll see a little separation as you go back and forth that that image will jump a little bit. That's euphoria. Um, the uh, so the euphoria as you come off it uh, it's a little confusing there but if you if, with the cover on cover test you'll see a refixation movement but. But you're, you're mostly with the cover on cover test. You're not worrying about the eye that you're uncovering. Whoops. It's a touch screen. Oh, I just bumped, bumped it here. The, um, so, let me come out of here. So, go to those tests. What test detects just the tropia? And what, what time do you want me to be done here, out of curiosity? Is it nice to get out? Like 10 to, 4 to, or? Right. Right. Okay. I'll try to be sensitive. There's a lot of stuff to cover, but I I, I, I find that I can only be interesting for probably about 20 minutes anyway. So the um, we'll try to make this too torturous. But uh, so what tests detect just the tropia of the cover and cover, alternate cover, or simultaneous prism cover? Just the tropia. Just cover and cover. You're right. Because 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 I'm not I'm, I'm not giving it time to build and then go back and forth. Is the simultaneous prism cover testing doing the tropia or the tropia and the foria? The where you go with the prism and the, and the occluder. What do you think? The simultaneous prism cover test. It's the same thing as cover and cover, you're just measuring it. Does that make sense? So those two detect just the tropia, and then what, which one's going to do the foria plus the tropia? The alternate cover, because you're breaking fusion and you're letting you're letting both the tropia and the foria come out. What do we what, what number do we care more about for surgery? That's a, that's maybe a bad question. What number are we going to do surgery for? The foria plus the tropia or just the tropia? Most of the time. Just the tropia. 
So actually, we do both. Because say you've got say you've got a, a, like a FOIA of ten or fifteen, that already puts them at a disadvantage of fusing, right? Because their eyes are in the relaxator out, and then you've got another twenty on top of that. I might as well take care of the tropia, and then also you know include the FOIA to make their eyes as straight as possible, so they have they don't have to fuse uh, as, as as much of a misalignment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, kind of tricky question. If the corneal light reflex suggests strabismus, so you can see that one eye looks out, corneal light reflex is not centered on that eye, but you do alternate cover testing and there's no movement. What is that? And they've got good vision out of both eyes. Pseudostrabismus. Yes. Um, it's, that was like an amazing answer. It's, it's correct, but it doesn't really tell you why. <laughs> Brilliant. The, um, uh, and, 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 so as a, what specific diagnosis would you give? I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a multiple choice. Um, anomalous retinal correspondence, angle kappa, or extravolgar fixation. And they're 20-20 in both eyes. Extracorneal fixation. What was that? Extra corneal fixation. Or extra, so extra, extra fovial fixation, no. that's what I'm going to say. Extra so if it's extra fovial fixation, meaning that they've developed a new fovea somewhere else in their retina, they're not going to have the rod and cone density to have 20 20 vision. So that's, that's, that's a bit, I love it. Wrong with confidence. That's right, that's right. You know, as you know, they say about surgeons, so usually right, always confident. I remember there was this person at, at uh, OHSU. <laughs> That this wise, uh, there was there was a kind of an interesting personality. And somebody else said, "Oh, you know what they say about him? Always confident. We say always confident, but almost never right." <laughs> so anyway, the uh, this would be angle kappa. Angle kappa meaning that uh, we'll, we'll go over that. But the fovea is kind of displaced either temporally or nasally, and it's angle kappa is when it's not aligned um, with the with with like the pupillary axis. So the eye looks misaligned, but the visual axis is actually straight. Um, why, why do we use corneal light reflex? It's quick, it's quick and easy. Reese's approach to most things in life. <laughs> like, just, just kidding. Some kids won't let you alternate cover. Yeah, perfect. And, and is, this, is this something you can do on the floor? If you know, I mean you. When you're doing a consult, you can't necessarily always do like a full motility exam, but you could easily check your pupillary light reflex if their eyes are straight. So this is Hirschberg. You're just looking for that light to be centered in both eyes. If it's off and you know that's your business, you can estimate it by one millimeter of decentration is 15 prism diopters um, of misalignment. So what is the average size of the pupil? If you had to guess. So yeah, so, so I, I agree. I probably, it depends light or dark. It's a pretty bad question, right? But the, the Hirschberg test, they always make you memorize these numbers. That if it's in the pupillary edge, it's about, if it's, if it's just off in the pupil, it's about 15. If it's in the pupillary edge, it's 30. If it's in the iris, it's like 45. They're assuming a four millimeter pupil. Does that make sense? So the other one's in the middle. So the radius from the, the central coil light reflex to the pupil is two millimeters. So about 30 prism diopters. So it's kind of pointless to just memorize their numbers, just understand that, that kind of um, this little factor right there. Krimsky test, you put prism in front of it um, to neutralize it to, until you get it centered, and that's how you know, and, and then you can actually you measure the pupil light reflex with prisms. And then Bruckner test, you do a direct ophthalmoscope, and if their eyes are misaligned, you often get a different red reflex. I don't know if you've ever seen that as, as you're looking at kids. I, I love the direct ophthalmoscope. I think it's maybe it seems like an archaic tool to a lot of ophthalmologists, but I feel like in the pediatric eye exam, you get a lot, you get, really use it for a lot of things. Um, so we already talked about this, but do you see how an angle kappa, if the fovea is, so the fovea, normally the fovea is here, but if the fovea is up here, the eye is going to have this kind of, let's pretend this is the left eye, here's the right eye, and we're looking for the bird's eye view. The eye is going to have this kind of outturning to line the fovea up, but when you look at the the kiddo, it's going to look like their eye is turned out. Does that make sense? So they're fixating, but uh, and then I don't know why, but they, they call this angle between these two the angle kappa. So for OCAS, here's how you can remember it. Positive angle kappa is when they, is, they look XT. 
And the way you've got the memory tool is that intermittent XT is less likely to cause amblyopia versus ET. So ET is more positive, whereas ET is that's kind of a negative thing. Anyway, it's kind of lame, but it, it works. Um, and then just think, positive angle kappa, the fovea shifted temporally away from the optic nerve. So do you, do you know some examples of when you actually will see like a dragged fovea? ROP. Is it typically going to cause a positive or an angle, a negative angle kappa? Positive, because it's usually dragged temporally where the disease is. Yeah. Perfect. Um, just some people just have angle kappa. It doesn't have to be ROP. Yes. Okay. Yep. That, it, sometimes they're just in the name is a little off. The, um, so um, this also I think is critical in understanding to business, but it's like Painful. And this is, I think, the wordiest slides I have, so I apologize. So, could somebody, you can, you're welcome to read, but could somebody in their own words define fusion for me? Any thoughts? And I'm mostly asking this because it's just so painful to just be lectured to this early in the morning. So, the more I feel like you talk, the, the less pain there is, and the faster it'll go by. <laughs> The sooner it'll be over, right? The um, so wh what is retinal correspondence? Anyone, can anyone, 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 give me a definition of retinal correspondence, meaning retinal points that correspond between the two eyes. Have you guys heard that term? So, so what, 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 what are they? What, what are the term trying to teach us or explain? Reese, do you have a thought? You look at your thought. Like the receptive fields are the same. So like, kind of like one point of light would kind of focus on the same receptive field in both areas. Yeah, and then those two areas are going to go back and communicate to the same part of the visual cortex, because the brain has decided those two correspond to each other. To the, they should, should be looking at roughly the same thing. Does that makes sense. Yeah, it's exactly right. So, fusion in many ways is normal retinal correspondence. You've got both eyes looking at something, and your brain instead of saying, "Wait a minute, I'm seeing two images," it takes the picture from both eyes and makes one picture of them. That's fusion. Your brain just sees one picture, but it uses both eyes. Um, the, uh, the, the fovea is super sensitive to dissimilarity between the two images. So a little misalignment in the fovea can cause, can throw off fusion. Um, but in the, in, the periphery, in the periphery, there's larger receptive fields, so they can tolerate more dissimilarity. And that, that, that relates to monofixation syndrome, which we'll talk about. Another just kind of confusing thing. But it's not that confusing if we kind of come at it just simplistically. So, so sensory fusion um, is, is, is this idea that the, the, the retinal points, the two images are brought into one picture, and it relates more to the afferent message, the, the, the image, the message from the retinas to the brain. Um, and in comparison to motor fusion, motor fusion is your brain saying, wait, these images are misaligned and it sends a signal back to your extraocular muscles to move the eyes to align them. So motor fusion is the eye movements that you do to get your eyes lined up, or that your eye, you know, that your muscles are essentially holding your eyes in a way that keeps them straight. Um, if I was to put a, like to your point earlier, uh, if I put a little four prism diopter or base out prism in front of one eye, your eyes gonna do a refixation movement to compensate for that, and that's motor fusion. Does that make sense? Um, the uh, stereopsis is, um, so stereopsis is amazing if you think about this. So if the pictures are mostly aligned, but again, if you, like, so I want you to hold something semi-close in front of your face that has like a little angle to it, and then, and I want you to go back and forth from the, from the two eyes, like maybe kind of turn it, get it to a point where you'll see actually it's, it's uh, the parts that are closer to it, closer to you versus further away from you, look quite different between the two eyes. And, and, and what, what's happening is that the, on, on the, the, the image, I mean, essentially you're, you have two different vantage points, especially with things up close, which is gonna cause things to look dissimilar on the corresponding retinal points, right? On these, especially on near, near objects. Your brain makes sense of how dissimilar they are and what ways they're dissimilar and creates artificially 3D. It's amazing, right? So it uses just the minute dissimilarities in order to create stereopsis or depth perception. 
which is kind of the highest level of um, sensory fusion. So a lot of what we do in strabismus is to, is to, is to adjust motor fusion in attempts to restore sensory fusion. Um, th this, I think, helps us explain a lot of, again, uh, one of our goals of strabismus is this, st this study in the Bacaw monkeys where they sewed one eye shut. Have you heard of this study? Um, so, pretty interesting. The eye that was sewn shut actually had anatomical changes. The eye actually grew and got, had a, a myopic shift. And I saw this in clinic just, yeah, just on Friday. There was a kid who had optic nerve hyperplasia um, in, in one eye, much more than the other eye. The eye that had it worse, it was, it was like LP or NLP vision, was like a minus seven. And the other eye was like a minus one. And they probably started off about the same size, but they were just having a myopic shift um, due to the fact that there, there, there wasn't, they, they couldn't, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Um, it, uh, is it anatropia? I'm drawing a blank. But anyway, they could, they, the, the eye can't focus on anything. It tends to just actually have my shift. Yes, amatropization, thank you. Um, so I want to focus on um, the strabismus part. So at birth, what do you notice about the right, so, the, so to explain this, your visual cortex has these alternating columns that correspond to right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, called ocular dominance columns. You'll notice here that they overlap. What happens between birth and then six months of age? Anyone want to kind of explain to me what, why this looks the way it does? What are your thoughts? This goes back to neurology more than ophthalmology. Pruning. Pruning. It's an act of pruning. Yep. Darwinism taking effect in your brain. Survival of the fittest. The neurons that aren't really helping out much just atrophy off. But what do you notice about, you'll notice that these overlap. What do you notice here? With strabismus. So the strabismus one, they ended up cutting a muscle, like essentially cutting one of the extraocular muscles so that they, they gave the, the monkey strabismus. What do you notice about the ocular dominance columns? They stop overlapping. They stop overlapping. They, so is, is, this, is this monkey going to have any sensory fusion? So this is, this is what strabismus does when untreated. You lose that overlapping fusion capability, and, and, and that's not the end of the world. I mean, you still want their eyes to look straight for other reasons, but, but it's not gonna, they're not going to hold it straight. They're going to lose a little bit of their binocular function. Congenital ET is like the most common one where it's an early enough strabismus that you see this happen. And these kids get all sorts of weird stuff because they don't have that normal fusion. They get DVDs and late nystagmus. Um, this is too boring to talk about. Let's we'll go skip this. Um, j j just for kind of high yield uh, OCAP sake, we'll just hit these two laws. The Sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation. Do you guys remember this law? So Sherrington, Sherrington is your muscles are trying to share the work. So if one guy's turned on, the antagonist needs to be turned off, right? We always talk about this in like uh, anatomy with the biceps and the triceps. So if the biceps contracts, your brain also tells simultaneously the triceps to relax. My shirt is extra medium, that's why you can't see it. You know. It's a lot of muscle on there, be careful. The, uh, the joke. The, uh, so, who breaks this law? In what case do you not get a, um, a muscle relaxing when its antagonist contracts? Any guesses? Starts with a D. Dwayne's. Yes. So Dwayne's, the sixth nerve, I, it's not, it's, there's various of Dwayne's, but I, to simplify, the sixth, the sixth nerve nucleus doesn't really form. So the third nerve tries to go over and innervate the lateral rectus. But what happens is that when, you, it, when, you, when the lateral rectus fires, the medial rectus is simultaneously fired, and both muscles pull the eye in, which causes the lid fissure narrow, narrowing. Not because it's actual an eyelid innervation, but it's the, the eye's being pulled back into the globe, and it causes the eye, the eye opening to close a little bit, and that's Duane's. Herring's Law, what's, what's, so Herring's Law, any guesses? So it's up there, I guess. I'll also go quickly through this. It's the yoke muscle. So if your left lateral rectus <laughs> fires, what other muscle is going to fire? Right medial, the yoke muscle to it. Yep. Who breaks this law? Oh, no, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. On the, so does dorsal midbrain um, with the co-contraction of stagnus, is that the same co-contraction of muscles that causes that, or is that a different etiology? That's a good question. It, so, I mean, by its name, yes, it is. It is. Right. 
sign of because because you see the, the greatest picture that you'll see on that dorsal midbrain when they're trying to look look up is that you look you look at it from the side. The videos will show the eyes are moving in and out of the socket. Have you seen that? So okay. so so it's not it's not just they're fluttering. If you look at it from the side, so if you if, if the patient's looking straight and you're looking looking at it from here, their eyes would be moving in and out. And that's because those muscles, again, are, are simultaneously co-contracting in kind of a nystagmoid fashion. So who, break, who breaks this law? Any guesses? When does one eye move up while the other eye stays straight? DVD. So a superior rectus should go up on both sides, but you'll get one eye that'll float up uh, and So, um, if a patient is not fusing, what other options are there for the brain and the eyes? So, if, so let's, say, let's say I got a misalignment, what options does my brain have? Suppress the other eye. Nice. Perfect. Come back. You're, 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 you're doing it. You're, you're nailing it. <laughs> the, um, what else? What happens if you don't suppress the eye? What do you have? Diplopia. Diplopia. There's a third option. Anyone know? Change the retinal correspondence. Anomalous retinal correspondence. So well, I'll explain that real quick. I never understood this until, again, fellowship. So, um, so anomalous retinal correspondence, um, it's a state that's superior to total suppression where your, 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 your brain says, well, you know what, maybe I'll just change the, the retinal points of correspondence since this T is, this, my left eye is always 20 diopters of ET. Why not just adjust to make that, those two retinal points correspond? Um, the, uh, so let, me, let me explain this real quick just a couple of pictures. So here's two eyes that are straight. So the image falls on both phobias. Normal retinal correspondence is perfect. You get an eye that's turned out. So you see, where's that image going to fall? Temporal or nasal to the phobia? Yeah. So if you were seeing this all day long, at some point, this eye is either going to suppress or turn off, be diplomic, or your brain can say, you know what, maybe I'll just I'll just change my topographical map of the retina as far as what my brain perceives, and I'll just have the temporal retina correspond to the fovea. That makes sense? The temporal mac, I should say. Um, what's going to happen, though, when I cover this eye? Am I going to fixate still over here? If I, if I cover this eye, am I going to fixate with the fovea in the case of anomalous retinal correspondence? So typically, when you cover up the other eye, they'll fixate with the fovea. If you don't, if you still fixate with that, then it's extrafoveal fixation, which is a, somewhat of a different animal than anomalous retinal correspondence. Super confusing, but angle kappa doesn't shift when you cover it up. Anomalous retinal correspondence does. Does that make sense a little bit? Because uh, you know, in angle kappa, what, what are they fixating with? Extrafovia or fovea? Fovea. Fovea, yeah. So again, same thing nasally here. So, um, how do we test for sensory adaptation? This, this, was a, this was a rough chapter to be assigned to. Just please, you know, give me that credit. This is, this is boring stuff. It's, it's not boring, but it's, it's tough stuff. So thank you guys for hang, hanging with me. Um, you guys are doing awesome. Again, I think this is really complex just to understand all these tests. So can someone explain to me how the worth four dot test works? <laughs> We're not gonna go through all these tests because we don't use, you don't use them, but we use the worth four dot. So here's your flashlight, here's the glasses you put on. If you, if you wear these glasses and I cover up the green eye, what are you gonna see in the flashlight? Two, How many dots? Two dots. Two. So you're gonna see the green ones are gonna disappear because you've got um, red, filter, red. red filter, yeah. And then if I cover the red eye, what are you gonna see? What, what is the, so the white dots is gonna turn whatever color you're looking to, right? Um, and I, 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 mean, I think about that backwards. So when you're, when you're wearing, when you're looking through the red, you actually don't see the red. Yeah. Sorry, guys, so I got that wrong. So if you're looking through the red, you're not going to see the red. If you're looking through the green, you're not going to see the green lights. And there's a different number of them because that way you get to see the, the, the white one just goes to either eye. So through the red eye, you see one, two, three dots. Is that right? That makes sense? Through the green eye, you'll see one, two, if, you have, if you're looking through both eyes, you have the potential to see four, but if you have a strabismus, then you'll see as many as how many? How would you guess? 
Would you see eight dots if, 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 if you have a strip business no. and, you, and you're diplopic? What would you see? Five. 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 You see, yeah. Three out of the right, two out of the left. Does that make sense? And you confuse them uh, if your eyes are straight. So if a patient puts these on and then you say how many, and you're holding the flashlight and, it, and, you, and then you ask them how many dots do you see, and they say three, what's going on? What are they doing? Suppressing, Suppressing which eye? Right. So if they, if they can see three, they can see they're seeing they're right, seeing the through left. they're seeing through the rest, so they're suppressing their left. It's always you're right. They're looking through the right eye, suppressing their left. Um, let me ask you a question. Uh, this is going to explain monofixation syndrome. It's, it's not as complex as it sounds, but uh, wh what did I tell you about the peripheral retina versus the central retina uh, in terms of its ability to tolerate dissimilarity? The peripheral retina tolerates more dissimilarity. Exactly. So if you've got a small strabismus that you can't really correct, what are you going to suppress first, the central or the peripheral vision? What's going to be more intolerable? Central. Central. So monofixation is you have a small enough angle that you can fuse peripheral retina, but you just can't quite fuse central. Here's the next confusing question. How do I test peripheral retina with the full worth four dot test? Do I, do, do I hold it up close or do I go far away? I'm going to test peripheral retina. Close. Up close. Because, because the images are going to be actually, it's, for me that's counterintuitive, but when they're up close, they're going to be going more to your peripheral retina. When they're far away, you actually just are fixing. It's actually quite central into your focus. So all monofixation is, is peripheral fusion central suppression. Um, so and the, when, you, when you put them up near, they see all four dots because they confuse the peripheral retina. But when you go in the distance, they say two or three. Again, too boring to talk about. It. Um, so uh, we'll call it there. The, um, I'm, I'm lecturing again in a few weeks, but um, we'll talk about the, um, the three-step Gotowski test, which I think is actually, again, difficult to understand if you just kind of memorize it, but we'll walk through it. We talk about the Baglini lenses in term too. Yeah, so, so, the, so that's a good question. The Baglini lenses, there's uh, the, the ones that have just like the striations that cause essentially like, like linear glare, right? So Bagley lenses are these lenses that have these um, lines through them that you still can see what you're looking at. So say I was looking at Ashley, I can still see it, but anything that's light is gonna cause these like horizontal bars. Um, when, you're doing, when you're trying to tense, test sensory adaptation, the red-green test is a problem, the worth four dot test is a problem because it's dissociating, meaning you see two very different things out of each eye and the really, the, the, the way, you, you, would, you don't know somebody's sensory adaptation unless you're giving them a normal picture out of each eye and then you figure out how well they fuse it. But you can't do that, you have, you have to put some test on them. So a Baglini test is less dissociating because I can still see through it, but it's causing these lines that I try to see if, those, if the lines that the striations and the lenses make line up. And the same thing like when you put like a red, like the, the, the Maddox test, just the, um, the red Maddox test, you just do one, so if I hold a bright light, I'm going to see a big line because the, 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 when you look at the light through those, the, the, the red Maddox uh, lens, it causes uh, lights to turn into a line. So you see like a, and then the other eye you leave uncovered. So I've got one eye looking at a white light, I've got another eye looking, it's creating a red line. And depending on how you hold it, you can see if, if those two cr uh, intercross or uh, are separated. There's also there's like the after image test, we have, under monocular conditions, you have them stare at one line that's like this, and then you cover the other eye, you have them stare at a line like this, and they have them open their eyes. And now, there's no, there's no suppression or test or, or interference with their vision, their vision, but you see if those two lines intersect to make a cross. And anyway, it's really complex and actually not that clinically helpful. But, 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 they, but the OCAPS loves to test on it. So, so sensory adaptation is trying to figure out how well are they really, is, is there a sensory fusion? Stereopsis is a great test for that. So, so that's, and that's a real nice, simple one. Um, the, uh, lastly, so I know uh, Chris Ricks is doing the resident side of wellness, and I'm supposed to do the fact side of wellness. So just on a side note, um, we've got to come up with these interventions to improve wellness. It seems counter, 
counterintuitive that I'm going to make you do something to add to your stress that's going to make you feel more well. But I want you guys to think about, um, the, I don't know, have you, guys, have you guys seen the Headspace app? Have you guys ever, have you guys ever um, mm -hmm. heard of this? It's this meditation app. Yeah. I, I started trying it after, you know, uh, most things in life that I make fun of, I'm doing later on. So like, like most of like I criticize somebody for like changing lanes without a blinker. I don't, I don't like do that within a week. So I once made fun of meditation. Actually, it's kind of cool. Uh, so Headspace is it's like it's a hundred dollar app that the university is providing for free, where you take ten minutes out of your day, which is really tough for me. Um, I'm sure it's even more so for you, um, just to like clear your mind. It's kind of nice. So do you guys have any thoughts on things that you think that would be helpful in terms of wellness? Adding a fourth resident was probably critical. Will you think about it and talk to Chris? Um, I, and then in my next lecture, I'd love to talk about uh, a few things that we'll start the lecture off by talking about uh, um, cognitive behavioral therapy and just healthy and unhealthy ways of thinking. And because and I, I just found as a resident, I was often so hard on myself and then I would do things, I just would get trapped into really unhealthy thinking. Like I would do nine things well and then I would miss the, uh, you know, um, miss a mucor patient and then just think I'm a total failure. Like, I'm either all good or all bad. And with the strikes and gutters, all of a sudden, you forget any strike you've ever thrown, you just focus on your gutters. And I think in a re as a resident here, I, I was constantly falling into these traps of just getting into unhealthy thinking about giving myself the benefit of the doubt and maybe being a little bit kinder to myself in hard times. It's really, it's a tough, it's a tough season. And so. We'll talk about those things. I would love your thoughts to get to Chris about how we can maybe try to improve wellness in the program. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.